In this episode, we are going to hear from a park ranger who didn't make it out alive, but he kept a journal of his terrifying experience he had in the deep backcountry while on a search and rescue mission. But before we get into the story, if you're a regular listener and haven't subscribed, then hit that subscribe button because I release stories of the strange and weird almost every single day. Also, stick around to the end of the video for a preview of the latest Donovan Dread true crime release. It's a David Politis case of a missing two-year-old boy who was found a day later under the craziest circumstances. Now let's get to the story. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food, so it doesn't feel threatened anymore and attacks a human. They all know it wasn't a bear though bears don't leave wounds like that, and they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a little bit about myself. Now, I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer anyway. That's partially why I'm sending you this. I need to tell somebody else about this story. And like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories. And everybody is used to weird stuff happening in the woods. But this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forest. Growls, yipping, even human-sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. All pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals steal food. They make weird noises and even human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So we sent our veteran backcountry ranger, Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years and was an expert outdoorsman, and he was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped right into the task, always eager to go into the backcountry, even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story, because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal and his flashlight in a backpack inside a small cave near the location of his body. A couple of days after he didn't return, we had sent out a search party to find him. And I haven't shared this journal with anyone, not even the other rangers, until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden, Other than that the truth seems so messed up and unreal, I didn't want to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything that I'm going to read to you had been written down over the two days he was out on the backcountry excursion on October 21st. Day 1. Today was a long day, and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day. Started down in the gully where the reports first started, and ended up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Ball Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier I found some tracks in the ground, in the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone, but maybe it was separated from its herd. Or dying. It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere. Near the tracks, there was this pervasive smell of death, and I assumed a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow, I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22nd. Morning of day two. Quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night one of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. 
I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No light so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be. October 22nd, night of day two. Stop for the night in the valley. Cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. No progress on the hikers and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, night of day two, second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try to block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. I got the cave entrance crack covered with a large rock and some brush. It'll have to do. The beast is still outside clawing at the crack in the rock. I don't think I'll sleep tonight. Not after what I saw. I might as well record this because this might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall. Possibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier, when I had left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing, and suddenly everything was silent. No voices. No hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet, knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up on my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. Then the thing dragged me right up against the tree. I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. That agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and preparing myself to die. When the crash in the distance distracted the beast long enough for me to make a break for it, I ran for my life. I didn't look back, but I knew it wasn't far behind me. About 20 feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside. I could hear it shuffling and trying to get into the crack. I could hear the heavy breathing the sucking, gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with this putrid smell of impending death. If I make it tonight, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range. But after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looked like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks. More specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gate matches. Something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged 70 feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable.
His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there. His arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strung out around the base of the tree. The jagged shadow remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing. Not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day and a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found. Those scraps of clothing matching what they had been wearing had been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of human voices coming from the woods, and we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. Some are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig. They're like warnings to other hikers who dare to intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. On May 14th of 1950, two-year-old Jackie Copeland was having fun at a picnic in Pleasantville, Pennsylvania, with his three sisters who were all older than him. This picnic was held for the firm that Jackie's father ran, so there were a large number of adults in attendance, in addition to a large number of other children. It was situated on a hill that overlooked a very swampy woodland. Jackie's parents were doing what most parents do at adult parties, trying to keep an eye on Jackie and his three sisters while at the same time attempting to have conversations with some of the other grown-ups. Jackie's mom was very watchful over her youngest child. Jackie was a great kid, but he was the youngest one there and was super friendly. He would play with anyone and everyone. Jackie's parents were having a conversation with another couple when at one point they became so engrossed in it that they stopped looking at their children for just a minute. After they finished laughing and talking, mom turned around to look for Jackie, but he wasn't where she last saw him. She didn't panic. There were a lot of people at this party. He had to be somewhere. So she started walking around just to put eyes on him, so to speak. Mrs. Copeland was searching but couldn't find Jackie. She grabbed her husband and said, I can't find our son. You need to help me. As they were searching everywhere, they ran into their daughters. They hurried over to them and said, Do you know where your brother is? And by the looks on their faces, Jackie's father could tell right away that the girls have no idea where their brother is. And almost immediately, he yells out to the group, I can't find my son. 